So uh, hello everyone and welcome to uh, another episode of Alter Insights Podcast and we have uh, another great guest here with us today. So Daniel Perez, some of you maybe know him from International Space Convention 22 or 23. Uh, for those that are coming across him for the first time, uh, he's a very great individual. Uh, met him a couple years ago uh, in Bursa, Turkey at our events. Uh, he shared a lot of great insights, very distinctive insights. Uh, and his company is working on very great things as well that we're going to cover here in just a bit. But a, a quick introduction to da Daniel while you can see him already on the screen. So uh, he has a great story about his passion for the space industry. And he has been dreaming about rockets and the places would he, he would reach through them since he was very young. And uh, he, he was passionate about everything geek, uh, in particular science fiction and the science behind it. Uh, which which I resonate with it fully as well myself, and that's that's awesome. So this passion and this resonation led him to become an aerospace engineer, and then later he also obtained a PhD in plasma and nuclear fusion. Uh, and he is also now the founder of Yeni Space, which is the first uh, company in Spain uh, that's working on developing in space propulsion, uh, which is very crucial to today's again landscape with the space debris and all of those things and the cost of maintenance for the satellite constellations as well so uh hi daniel pleasure to have you on once again so uh and then thank you yeah thank you guys forward thank to you for getting back some of the updates that your company has awesome yeah thank you for having me and uh, yeah thank you for the for the great introduction uh yeah i think uh i think one of the things that we all share in the in the space community is a, is a passion for space and for reaching out into the beyond and uh let's say trying to peek at what's uh what's behind the the next corner whether that's uh you know from the scientific point of view or from the commercial point of view more and more and more lately which is also uh, i think good news for the industry so uh so yeah yeah uh, very excited to to be here with you perfect yeah what what i like the most with, about you daniel is that you know even though you were in the business side of things and then the like heavy tech side of things the passion is not lost with you which we see many cases that you know individuals just get caught up too much into the business side too much into the numbers and commercial side of it uh and the passion just moves to the second flank but for you it's kind of equal equal so that's very nice we, we're trying to keep again the passion first as well uh in our company yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I think I might be uh, lucky enough that I, I've, I've been a bit of a late arriver uh, into the space industry because, um, so, so I, I'm an aerospace engineer by training. Uh, when I finished uh, my my masters, uh, I did go out to to work for the space industry for just a very little bit. My first job was actually working for uh, Bradford Space Engineering, which is a company in in the Netherlands, which have been ex has been expanding quite a lot over the last few years. So mo most of uh, of the people viewing this will we'll probably know them. Uh, but I was only there for a short time. And then I kind of moved back to uh, aeronautics, uh, also in the propulsion side, but um, more for aircraft. So so space had always been a bit of a, a dream to to come back uh, to back it come back into. And um, yeah, and then and then back in 2013, I went back, I, f I finally, let's say made the transition back, but let's say through a PhD, which is, um, I would say, a uh, uh, a fairly different way of, of approaching the industry that uh, that most people uh, most people in the commercial side uh, take. So so I've I've been kind of like taking the long road back into the industry, and then and then when we when we finished the PhD, uh, uh, myself and and some of the colleagues from uh, from from that time, we decided to um, to start ENI Space. So I, I think precisely because I've been kind of like an I, I felt kind of like an outsider um, mm -hmm. to the industry for a long time. I've, I've, I think that has helped with like, um, let's say, uh, still having that passion and that that motivation for the industry. And and in all honesty, like you know, uh, uh, for us, the, the the commercial side of things is is uh, and and don't t don't take don't take these words out of context. But uh, it, it's a little bit the the excuse to do what we do. We we love propulsion. We love, um, you know, making sure that satellites can reach new places and that we can you know, that uh, to, to develop new technology and so on. And at the end of the day, 
the way to do this and to have the biggest impact is to do it, um, I, I think, through a commercial uh, venture, right? Because that means that you're going to be able to work on the, you know, cutting most cutting edge missions. You're going to work with the with the really cutting edge um, companies out there. So, so for us, you know, having this kind of like commercial approach is, is almost an excuse uh, so that we can we can do what we like to do, which is you know, develop new technology and 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 build new uh, new but small rocket engines, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about in. in in a minute but uh but yeah so i think i think that's probably a good summary of how i've been able to <laughs> still keep my motivation and 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 have a fresh outlook on, on on the industry good perfect perfect so thank thanks for that again and obviously yes we will unpack and unpack fully the uh technology that your uh, company is again offering to the mm -hmm. market but you mentioned again that your colleagues so you went from the university uh straight into the industry so with a phd side and your colleagues, just to make sure, were they studying together with you for the PhD? Yeah, so we have a, you know, we have an origin story as as, as every other company does. So uh, yeah, so my colleagues uh, Sara Correllero and and Mick Vinen, which are our COO and CTO respectively. So we were all doing our PhDs at the same university, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid, so a university, a well-known university in Spain, and and actually starting to be a well-known technical university in Europe. Um, and uh, it was it was basically the only university in Spain that was um, that was de researching uh, electric propulsion systems, which is what we are now developing also uh, in the company. And back in 2017, there was the International Electric Propulsion Conference, which is like the largest international conference on this this particular niche of niche of technology. And um, we we actually applied for a program that was called the Young Visionaries Program, which was basically you need you needed to uh, present a paper and also record a video to talk about let's say innovative new solutions that um, that um, you know might be might be interesting for the industry in in the coming years. And uh, we decided to to um, uh, apply with a paper where which actually set set kind of the basis of what we we've, we've ended up doing with with the company. But uh, at the core of that paper was the idea that um, what, we, what I've been talking for quite a long time, which is the fact that uh, most propulsion providers in the industry solve what we call the direct propulsion problem. So what that means is you have a you have you take a propulsion problem. You see if it fits on the spacecraft, and then you see what missions you can carry out with that propulsion system. And we believe that things actually needed to be turned around. So you needed to actually start looking first at the platform that you're going to be uh, using, the the capabilities of the platform, the limitations as well. Then look at the missions that you wanted to carry out, and those two things should really define the optimal propulsion system for your uh, for your mission. Yeah, and. Um, so we, we proposed a paper to to have this to to kind of like explore this outlook, particularly for a uh, a mission to deploy a lunar communications constellation. So uh, actually, it was a lunar positioning system constellation. So kind of like a GPS, but for the moon for future manned missions. And we were actually able to to achieve quite quite a bit of um, let's say a better opti optimal points for uh, let's say for the use of the propulsion system in terms of like. Uh, total propellant mass and and and, and total time uh, of, of deployment by using by using this kind of like uh, concurrent design approach of you know propulsion system flight dynamics uh, systems engineering and so on and you know that was kind of like just the first idea and I think at the time it was it was quite you know back in 2017 I think it was quite innovative um, and we kind of looked out there and we didn't see anyone doing this right we didn't see anyone um uh you know have taking this approach and and yeah and then we we you know when 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 things you know a couple of years after or actually one year after when i when i finished my phd um you know we were still not seeing anyone doing this uh now things have changed a little bit but we were still not seeing anyone doing this and and furthermore um, let's say in Spain, there was there was no uh, propulsion provider really. There was no heritage of, of propulsion products in in uh, uh, at, at a national level. So we just kind of saw that niche and we decided to to go for it. And and here we are, uh, four years after. Perfect, wonderful. That's a that's a great story and, and and really again insightful. And just to follow up on that story now as you move it forward, right? Okay, so you got the idea. Uh, you got the colleagues, right? So, uh, and then the beginning of the company, right? So you yeah. would have required the capital to obviously start the company as, as it's not, uh, it's, it's a bit of a different company than what we do here, right? So our mm -hmm. business, 
doesn't require too much upfront investment, right? Uh, but in your case, obviously, with the propulsion systems, you have to test them, you have to develop them, right? So there's a hardware component to it as well. So yeah. uh, how did you go about that? Where did you even begin? Uh, and mm -hmm. how did it turn out for you? Obviously, we know now, but back then, so what were some of the challenges that as a young startup in Spain, the first company that's developing a similar, like this type of technology, uh, what was the perception from the, let's say, investors, from the private or from the public side? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. how did, did you tackle those challenges and how did you get to where you are today? That That's a great question. And, and um, to be honest, I think that you know, maybe some of the insights that I have for or helpful for some some of the, the people out there uh, trying to start their own uh, space companies. So, uh, for, first of all, I, I'd like to say I think we have a, uh, we had a little bit of a, a misjudgment of of the industry and particularly of the of the VC space because at the time there were already starting to be quite a lot of let's say private investment in into the space industry, particularly in the U.S. And you know, we we were of the mind of hey, like you know, we're going to start a, a company. We have PhDs. Like you know, we know what we're doing. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, money's gonna rain on us, right? And and uh, uh, spoilers that that did not <laughs> that did not go the way that we wanted it to go. Um, uh, no, so at the beginning it was very tough. Uh, I I actually like you know we well first of all we set some milestones. So we said like we're not gonna uh, not have a salary for more than a year, right? Like if we, if we go on for more than a year without the capability of like actually paying ourselves like this doesn't make sense. And it actually ended up being something like a year and three months. Um, so, so we were very close to like, you know, making a decision of like, Hey, maybe, maybe this isn't working out and maybe this doesn't make sense. Um, and I think, it, I think at an early stage, it's very important to set those milestones. Um, just so it's kind of like a go, no go thing. Right. So it's like, I have to have a salary in a year. So have been able to like raise either public or private funds. I have to have X clients by this amount of time I have to have, because it, that will, that will give you, let's say the, let's say, first of all, something to pursue. And second of all, a measure of, let's say, whether you're succeeding, whether things are happening or not, you know, for you and so on. So I think having those milestones is actually um, uh, quite important. But yeah, the, the first few years were, were very tough. Um, you know, I always say that I think, I think these days, uh, th this day and age, there's, al there's always been the perception, there is still the perception that all the manufacturing industries are capital intensive. Mm -hmm. I particularly do not like that word very much uh, because I've I've you know particularly in Spain where the the venture capital let's say landscape is heavily focused on um, uh, let's say uh, software companies right and mm -hmm. and kind of like. Uh, maybe this is the the wrong way. Maybe someone's going to get pissed off at me, but like copycats, sure. basically, right? A lot of like companies are just trying to replicate models from other companies that have been successful in the U.S. So that's kind of like the venture capital uh, landscape. Most of the venture capital landscape that we have, we do have private investors now, so there are obviously private investors with a bigger appetite appetite for risk and 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 trying to to get into the manufacturing industries. But but one thing I always like to discuss is like, look, over the last twenty to thirty years. If let's say the global manufacturing industries haven't tried anything else, uh, they've they've tried to reduce manufacturing costs at a maximum, right? Like I think that's that's that this has happened across all manufacturing industries over the last like twenty to thirty years. I think, for example, three D printers are, are an amazing uh, example of of let's say of flexibilizing and and reducing the cost for prototyping, you know, things like that. And and there's. Uh, and, and examples or, you know, a huge amount of examples of basically industries reducing the costs of entry and reducing the manufacturing costs. So when people ask me about like, you know, uh, us being a very capital intensive company, I always like to say the same thing, which is like, look, I've seen software companies that were doing, you know, like an app to do um, uh, payment uh, managing or something like that, that are looking for something like 200 million in investments so that they can yeah. go out into the in, and do the right marketing and basically outcompete all the other hundred companies that are doing the same thing just based on the marketing, right? And so, so the the amount of capital that is now being put into so so it's it's re it's really interesting, right? Because you have software companies which are easy to build. But they're so difficult to differentiate this day and age and potentially now with AI much more so because things are going to be built uh, 
much cheaper and 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 much easier in, in in the future. So you have software companies that are kind of like easy to build, easy to to to, to deploy, but so difficult to stand out that for a company to stand out, really all the investment that they get is going into marketing, you know, generating leads, all that kind of stuff, right? And then and then you have the manufacturing industries where the the entry barrier, typically the know-how entry barrier is much harder um and where you would be spending uh, you know, you would ideally you would think like, okay, well, I could spend those 200 million in like make, you know, making, making something right. But actually 200 million is a massive amount uh, for the space industry. Like, I don't know, most startups that I know, like the big success, success stories now, particularly in Europe is like 20 million rounds, 40 million mm -hmm. rounds, right? Like 200 millions is a massive amount of money. And I keep seeing software companies raise those amounts, right? Or like the unicorns are raising those amounts. And they keep telling us, right? When I talk to investors, they keep telling us like, oh no, you're a capital in 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 intensive company. It's like, am I really a capital intensive company or all the, all the software companies are spending huge amounts of cash on marketing the real capital intensive companies. So, um, so I, first I would like to challenge that notion that that space companies are, are you know, uh, uh, hugely capital intensive. Of course we do hardware and, um, and there needs to be money, right? And uh, at the beginning, we had no money, right? So, so I always say that we burned all the favors we could. So we basically have no favors outstanding in the industry or anywhere else. Uh, we we asked for so much, uh, so many favors from you know across universities, across um, you know or or uh, university the or alma mater, so like the the, the research department that we were uh, that we came out from. Uh, we actually got in touch with uh, a friendship, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, childhood friend from uh, Sara Corriero or COO, which was a guy that was working in, in a university in Uppsala, and he was doing micro manufacturing, which is actually a, a key technology to the propulsion system that we're developing. And he offered to kind of like just just make the first uh, prototypes for free. Um, so every, everything we did really was was for free. And it was just like contacting cool. people and like they were really excited about the the opportunity and about like, you know, being able to get engaged with us and so on. So, um, you know, I think I think, I, you know, at, trying to sorry, trying to summarize your question. So I think there's like, you know, three things, right? So like, yes, the beginning was really hard. We had no money. We basically had to like, uh, we had no salaries for the first year. I actually had a second job as a tour guide um, uh, <laughs> in Spain uh, uh, to, to be able to kind of like live off it while while the company started to work. We then after one and a half year, one point point three years, so like, sorry, one year and three months, we got our first public funding and we, we also got into the Airbus Accelerator at the time, which was also like funding, giving you a little bit of like, let's say funds to develop MVPs. So that's where we got, let's say, our initial funding and we were able to um uh let's say you know start to to do things but in the meantime so, so that that first year almost year and a half we were just like asking for favors and just trying to 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 get off by um uh, you know with, with what we could but but again i would also like to challenge the idea that space companies are uh, hugely capital intensive because i see a lot of money is being spent on software these days and i don't see anyone saying that software companies are capital intensive <laughs> I do agree with that, Daniel. And, and again, it's a great point that you brought up and, and a great story, really. Uh, and that's also what we've been really pushing out the message as well, which is get creative, right, as a company. So exactly. we've seen many examples. And that notion that you're talking about also, it came from those companies' examples, right? That yeah. we see companies going out of business just because they cannot close a race round, right? So that's that's not the way that, to go yeah. down. Right. And that happened, that happened, by the way, with one of our competitors, which was uh, Pork Shop. I don't know yes. if you, you heard know. about them. Yes. I was so surprised by that because, you know, they, uh, they, I, I think they flew their first mission. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, com you know, complete other, you know, conversation about the technology and, and what, what, you know, what we thought about, let, let's say, um, uh, pulse plasma thrusters, which is the technology that they were uh, employing. But, you know, they, they, they had like, you know, at least enough funding to, you know, Push their first propulsion system out into space. Um, they had they were pivoting to kind of like something like a, a OTV model, so orbital transfer vehicle, but for smaller spacecraft. Which I thought was yeah, there was a niche for that and so on. And suddenly they were like, oh, we never ran, we didn't close the round, so we um, we closed the company. And mm -hmm. and that was insane for me because I mean, I getting money for space is really hard. Like I've been 
I particularly have been working on a financing round for probably like the last year. And, and the, the current landscape is extremely hard. But there is so much public funding available, both on the national level and on the European level in, in, your, in Europe, that um, I, I was very surprised by that. Like even in Spain, which is, I would say, not very well known for, you know, for uh, putting a lot of money into, into deep tech or into uh, R&D, like we've managed to get something like probably like a million to a million something, a million and a half maybe uh, from public funding from national, national grants. But what is true is that you, you have to... You, you have to you have to be wanting to play the game right so so if you're if you're just betting everything on on the private investment exactly yeah. private investment private investment is, is a russian roulette i i always call i always say that private investment is, is like a russian roulette right you get the click 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 and then maybe you blow your brains out uh sorry for the expression uh but but so 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 it, you you really cannot rely only on on, on the private investment and i, I think I think one good thing about Europe, uh, and of course in the U.S., there's much more pub, uh, private investment. It's much easier to get private investment um, in, in in the U.S. than it is in Europe. But at least, at least, if you're willing to play the game, if you're willing to go for the public funding route, you can probably not go as quicker as you'd like, which is what's happening to us. But you can still play that game. You can still try to develop your technology. So, so I was very surprised by that, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to get in touch with this with the uh, CEO at some point and, and ask him what happened because I was I was very surprised. So yeah, uh, reliance yeah. or over reliance on private funds is um, is uh, something to to watch out for. I would say. Perfect, and I can make that introduction for you as well because there's ah, awesome. CEO uh, Matija. Uh, so he, yes, he was yes. yeah he was supposed to be speaking at ISC, and then he came. Came back a few months before and said, "Oh, we're closing down the company." So mm -hmm. uh, he mm -hmm. kind of dropped yeah. out from the speaking slot as well. So uh, yeah. I, can, I can do that introduction for you. I never really got a chance to really speak with him because mm. you know I just they don't want to get into that right after the process. Sure. And yeah, sure. it could be a bit not comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, man, I, I I cannot I cannot imagine like the process of like having to close a company. You know, like there's so much effort. You know, you put so much effort, so much of your so much of your everything really like you know it's not only your time you know i always say that you know in order to be an entrepreneur it has to be your job but it also has to be your hobby and your like uh wife or whatever i or, know i know like, it's, it's tough it's tough yeah I, i'll yeah. close down a couple myself uh yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. it was more of a not that long of a process like years but it, it has definitely been up to a year a couple of those companies as well so sure. But good so you know you, you you try things you failed and you move on you know you you move on exactly. to new adventure right so exactly. uh, and and again that led to alter enterprises that led to the international space convention to alter insights podcast to all of those things so yeah mm. uh yeah, you, you always you always learn and you always yeah. yeah you yeah. always learn and you always have that that possibility of of um of uh just using all the all the know-how that you've uh that you've yes. compiled right and 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 use that for uh for your next your next venture basically so that's that's exactly. always a, a plus yeah Exactly. All right. So now we can dive right into again the ENI space and unlocking in space mobility. So this is again the as a model for your company. So you offer propulsion systems uh, that are one of a kind for one of a kind space missions, as your again crispy looking website stated uh, that I looked <laughs> up earlier today. Uh, and you also uh, not only uh, again give them the propulsion systems uh, that are equipped on the satellites. Uh, but you also uh, help them with the software tools uh, that yeah. are needed for them to properly and safely use your propulsion systems as well. So uh, maybe you can expand again a bit more on that sure. and how vital that technology actually is for satellites, which are less than 300 kilograms again, which mm. they are designed for. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's perfect. So, um, so yeah, we call ourselves a mobility company or an in-space mobility company rather than a propulsion provider, right? And what we were trying to do there was basically differentiate from, um, uh, let's say, a lot of the, you know, I would say traditional or typical propulsion providers that were out there, um, uh, that were out there in the industry, right? And so when, when we came out uh, with the company, we, uh, let's say, I, I, it's, it's, it's taking us quite a while to actually, you know, being able to distill what it is that we want to do. And I think I'm able to like speak about this now, but it's been a lot of like, you know, learning. It's been a big learning process for us to to really understand what the pain points in the industry are um, and, and what it is that we're really trying to solve. So um, I, I would say that like right now, what we're trying to solve is, is basically two, pain, two big pain points in the industry. One is uh, 
a pain point associated to the uh, first of all the the satellites out there that are first of all either not carrying a propulsion system today or that are carrying a propulsion system but that have to uh, take quite a lot of penalties because of carrying that propulsion system mm -hmm. and and let me explain so basically uh last year so about you know just just kind of big numbers right 2000 satellites were launched half of that were starlink so everything you know elon's doing you know vertical integration not really a lot of people are selling to them um uh, particularly not propulsion providers uh, and then you have the other remaining part of the commercial industry which is about a thousand satellites um, and, and about 40% of those, 35 to 40% of those, we estimate did not carry a propulsion system last year. So uh, that was mainly, you know, picosats, uh, small cubesats uh, in general, uh, and so on. What we see is that, you know, beyond the 30 kilogram uh, satellite class, the adoption of umber propulsion is pretty much, uh, is pretty much uh, you know, everywhere. But below 30 kilograms, most satellites are still not carrying uh, umber propulsion. Now, there's a number of reasons for that. It can be, there's just, you know, we always get asked, like, is that because, you know, they don't need it? Yes, that's true. Some, some satellites will not need propulsion, even though now that's going to be regulated. So very potentially that in the future will not fly as well. Like if you, if you throw a satellite out there, it can't just be like a brick, you know, doing the orbits, like you need to be able to maneuver the the satellite out of harm's way um, in case of a potential collision and so on. So, so the industry is tending towards uh, the more and more adoption of propulsion systems to the point that perhaps there will be some orbits, perhaps things like under 300 ki uh, kilometers of, of altitude, where you could put satellites that don't have propulsion, but those are only going to last, you know, maybe a few months of uh, of mission, right? So those are mainly going to be things like in-orbit demonstrators or like prototypes or things like that, but they're going to burn up really quickly. They're going to deorbit and burn up really quickly. So the, the industry, there's a lot of, you know, there's a big part of the industry that now things like, oh, we're not going to need propulsion or we don't need propulsion but that might be regulated away uh, and then there's other there's two other constraints basically one is that the the own limitations in let's say the mass power and volume budget of the spacecraft so what we found is that a lot of the uh, people you know doing picosats or doing small cubesats or you know even even not so small cubesats even up to like 12 view things like that um just don't want to have to redesign their satellite in order to incorporate a propulsion system, which which makes sense, right? Because like at the end of the day, you have your own engineers. You want to be able to like build your own platform and have, uh, uh, you know, that make sure that every subsystem that you put in there has the lowest footprint over over your spacecraft, right? Because at the end of the day, your spacecraft is an asset that is trying to produce a revenue, right? If you have to, uh, you know, if you have to compromise on the revenue generating capabilities of that of that asset. Because you're integrating other subsystems, then you're not probably doing you're you're not doing a good job, or that's not something that you want to do. Uh, that's another aspect, and then there's a third aspect, which is cost, right? So propulsion systems have typically been um, quite heavy in cost. Uh, there's a number out there uh, that historically propulsion systems have been around 20 to 25 percent of the uh, cost of a satellite mission. That is certainly true for uh, geostationary satellites and and big satellites, uh, but now there's um, Quite a lot of recommendations saying, like, listen, the the propulsion system should really not go above fifteen percent, or even more preferably ten percent of the of the total cost of this of the satellite platform. Um, in order to do that, you have to fundamentally uh, uh, address the manufacturing of propulsion systems in a different way. So things like mass production, or or at least have the idea that you're going to have enough volume production to offset the the lower costs of um uh, of the propulsion system and also to have higher margins on 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 each propulsion system so that that combination of three things is what's having that 35 to 40 percent of the of the com current commercial industry by volume right uh not adopting propulsion systems which by the way is a crazy number to me right like the fact that almost half of the satellites out there don't don't have a propulsion system for the other half that uh, do have a propulsion system uh, propulsion systems have have typically been have have had quite a lot of issues by the way I have to say that most of the fragmentation events just something you know maybe to start with this most of the fragmentation events that have happened uh, in in orbit so most of the you know explosions that have happened in orbit with satellites you know kind of like exploding or having issues have come from the propulsion system so have come from failures of the propulsion system uh, and that's particularly true for uh, chemical propulsion systems where yeah you have you know an energetic uh, uh, propellants that can explode and can have uh, leaks and are pressurized and have issues right so propulsion systems have been um you know have issues right or or they have 
uh, you know, quite a lot of, you know, maybe they have huge thermal loads, right? That's true, for example, for electric propulsion systems such as hall effect thrusters, where quite a bit of the of the watts of the power that you're putting into the uh, into the propulsion system uh, needs to be, uh, uh, let's say, redirected as heat or, or or rejected as heat, and 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 that may have an impact on the on the spacecraft. Or you have propulsion systems that have low efficiency, right? That uh, you're putting a lot of power in, but you're not really getting out that much uh, that much propulsion power let's say um out of it so so in a, looking at the technology today we have you know either quite a big a quite a bit part of the satellites that are not carrying propulsion systems and we believe that it's not because they don't i mean it could be because they don't want to but that's going to be regulated away so at the end there's there's mainly two reasons why that's not happening one is cost the other one is uh, uh limitations on the spacecraft and then you have the rest of this of the satellites that are carrying propulsion systems that where they have to take penalties or they have to take pain points uh, in order to be able to incorporate those propulsion systems so so we saw that pain point and and we realized that uh, a new technology or new technologies were really needed to deal with this sort of issues and then we have and that, that's one block of what we're doing now and then there's a second block which is the know-how right so um this is actually something very interesting because when you talk to people that are outsiders from the industry they believe that you know they'll say like oh yeah satellites you know, uh, aerospace engineers, whatever, right? But actually, most satellites are not manufactured or designed by aerospace engineers. They're actually designed by electronics engineers, uh, industrial engineers, uh, software engineers. You know, you have all those people that are not space space engineers, um, uh, you know, working on these systems. Of course, you will have some space engineers. But at the end of the day, as I said before, the uh, satellite platform is an asset. It's an, it's an asset that forms part of your infrastructure to deliver a service or data or whatever. Um, and, and most of the design is, is thought of from that point of view, right? So propulsion and flight dynamics and mobility are actually a niche within a niche. They're, they're you know, within the space sector, they're also, they're actually considered a, a, a bit of a small niche. And of course, larger companies like Airbus or Boeing or whatever could, you know, could, um, uh, could have like, let's say these, these um, uh, com um, departments that were focused on the flight dynamics and the propulsion aspect. But what happens when you go into, let's say, smaller companies that, you know, they're just trying to build those satellites, they're just trying to provide those first data, those first images so that they can, let's say, build that business model around it. Like, Having a, a propulsion engineer in-house is not necessarily cost-effective, or it's not necessarily aligned with the core, uh, uh, let's say, the core know-how that you're trying to develop within within the company. So we saw those two problems, and we said, like, all right, we need to we need to solve this from a holistic point of view, right? Through a holistic analysis or through a holistic view of the industry, and and basically what we translated that that vision was into uh, a product ecosystem that, as you said before, is based on uh, a propulsion product and also a um, uh, a couple of software products. So, and just just to briefly address those, so, so our propulsion product is called Athena. It's an electric propulsion system, mm -hmm. and we've we've particularly um, um, uh, focused on electric propulsion. First, of, first, because that's that's what we know how to do. We're, we're electric propulsion engineers. We come from electric propulsion PhDs. But also because we we you know if you look at the industry out there today, perhaps all constellations, perhaps not all of them, but most constellations, staggering amount of constellations are uh, adopting electric propulsion systems as the main propulsion system, and we see. We see that's where we see very clearly that's where the industry is going. I think chemical is going to be almost relegated to uh, human or uh, cargo ships, where there's like a time sense, very time sensitive scenario, and pretty much everything else is going to be using electric propulsion. And by the way, for constellation deployment maneuvers, which are uh, you know kind of like what you need to do at the beginning of a deployment of a constellation, there are ways in which you can also make electric propulsion systems work in a cost effect, uh, sorry, in a time effective way. So you can actually save both mass, which is what you typically save by using electric propulsion, quite a lot of propellant mass. You can typically save electric, uh, sorry, uh, propellant mass, but also time under some scenarios um, versus chemical uh, propulsion systems. We can talk about that later because that's a very uh, kind of counterintuitive thing that we're trying to also bring to the industry. So we're developing that propulsion system. It's a customizable propulsion system. It's called Athena. It's based on electrospray technology. As I said before, it's the first propulsion system manufactured in Spain, but it's also the first electrospray system uh, or what we, what we like to say the most advanced electrospray system manufactured in Europe. That's a technology that's actually only been developed in the US before. And now we're at the front, front, forefront of development of electric propulsion in uh, of electrospray propulsion in, in Europe. And it's a technology that has really high efficiencies and that 
um, can be built in a way so that it is highly customizable. And the highly customizable aspect is what ties back to that idea that, you know, remember that we talked about uh, what we what we presented to the International Electric Propulsion uh, Conference, which was to be able to solve the inverse propulsion problem. So basically look at that satellite platform, look at those missions and those maneuvers that you want to carry out and give me the most optimal propulsion system to do that. In order to do that and not have to do a development uh, from scratch every time, you need to be able to build through building blocks. So you build the building blocks and then you assemble those building blocks in different ways to meet the uh, demands of, of the sat of the um, of the mission and, and, and the satellite platform. So um, we built that propulsion system in that way. We uh, launched it to orbit last year. Unfortunately, that was aboard the Firefly Alpha 2 mission, which left satellites at a very low orbit so that we only had about a, a week of, uh, of testing the propulsion system in orbit. But we're already looking forward to to, to test those propulsion systems in, in orbit ne next year. So that's one, one part of what we do, and we can talk more about the propulsion system. But it, basically, what we're trying to do is solve all of the pain points that I was, that I was uh, telling you about before. So the cost, the, limit, the, the fact that you have to deal with limitations and mass, power, and volume budgets, and also uh, all the other pain points that uh, uh, clients have had to deal with when adopting other kinds of propulsion systems. So low efficiency, uh, toxicity and explosiveness, uh, heat loads, and all that kind of stuff. And then and then we have the knowledge part of you, right? And and for, for quite a while, we were trying to, you know, kind of bring out our knowledge on propulsion and flight dynamics as a um, kind of in, in a consulting uh, way. So kind of trying to market it as a consulting way. But we kept and, and we've developed our own internal house, uh, internal uh, or in-house tools in order to to provide that um, that know-how, and we kept talking with our clients, and they were saying they were saying like, hey, we want to try those tools, we want to be able to license those tools, and so on. So what we've done over the last three months is actually pivoted, and we took our uh, space mobility analysis software as a service, uh, uh, which was 360, um, and we took that, and we've now made a licensable version. So now we've made it into a software as a service, as I was saying before, and this tool is basically something like GMAT or SDK or some of the mission analysis tools that people are in, uh, used to in the industry, but with a very specific focus on space mobility. So it's actually solving quite a lot of the issues, the recurrent issues that we've seen uh, happening in the industry. Things like how to do in an easy way propulsion system comparison, how to optimize the operations of the propulsion system uh, during the design phase, how to uh, do concurrent engineering of the propulsion system with other subsystems in the spacecraft so that I can have visibility of how those are going to be affected by um, uh, or how those two things are going to going to play along together once once I've built my satellites. So we've coded all that know-how into a uh, software as a service that we're uh, going to that we actually have we're we're doing a closed beta for it now. So we have a couple of companies, um, uh, you know, uh, in in the closed beta right now, and we're going to be publishing uh, in in a let's say in a commercial way uh, in at the end of, of Q2 uh, this year. And then finally, this is something that's going to be coming out next year. One of the other pain points that we always saw when we were talking with clients were like, all right, propulsion providers come, they give us, you know, the propulsion system, they give us the engine, and then they kind of like, that's it, that's their job done. They don't, um, they don't, let's say, necessarily provide support when it comes down to like operating the propulsion system once it's in orbit or optimizing the operations and things like that. And we saw that that was actually a huge, uh, unappreciated part of the value chain that is more allocated to, towards kind of like the spacecraft operators um, uh, market, but where where actually, let's say, the, the propulsion providers, I think, have really a lot to say there because at the end of the day, it's their baby, it's their propulsion system. They should know how to operate it best. They should be able to uh, provide uh, systems uh, through or tools through which to operate those uh, propulsion systems in the best way possible, and that's what we're doing with a tool that we're coming out next year, which is called Orbital, um, and that we hope that can that can uh, also reduce the entry barriers towards the adoption of of or Athena propulsion systems. Perfect, wonderful, and and again, that cost will be uh, incorporated within the price of the propulsion sale, or will that be as a subscription based, or how, how do you, how do you yeah, understand? that's a great question, and so we've we've basically split it in. In, in, in that way, right? So we're, we're trying, again, we're always trying to reduce the entry barriers to the, towards the better, more and better adoption of propulsion systems out in the industry. Uh, because, because we believe propulsion systems have, can add a lot of versatility and functionality towards missions, but also because very, very soon we believe that it's also going to be regulated and it's going to be mandatory, right? So, so what we've done is we've reduced the entry cost of Athena. So we've lowered that entry cost towards about 10% of the, of the estimated cost of satellite platform. We're targeting that amount. Okay. Um, and then what we're trying to do is we're trying to, as a business, uh, recover some of that, that let's say, uh, uh, price that we're 
or not uh, putting out into the industry through the uh, recurring uh, subscription model of Orbital, right? So in that way, we can generate value throughout the whole lifetime of the satellite. Um, and, uh, you know, for if for whatever reason, like let's say a mission uh, uh, finishes early, or if, you know, if, for, if uh, you become a bigger company and you, you can afford to have like, you know, spacecraft operations engineers that are, you know, very knowledgeable on propulsion or whatever, then, hey, you can, you can stop paying for the, um, subscription model and 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 just use your own in-house tools but we also believe that the price point of um of uh of orbital is going to be very very competitive and for example just a, as a comparison um uh i i've i've basically heard very recently that uh some of the uh collision avoidance ma uh, maneuver companies are providing warnings and maneuver uh suggestions at something like 25,000 dollars the maneuver right per maneuver so they will come out to a company and be like hey like you need to you're going to have a collision of you're going to have a collision you need to maneuver out of the way uh that's uh this is the maneuver that you need to do that's 25k which is insane in my opinion but, but um, they still leave you you know in a mass situation right so you, you cannot say oh no i'm going to live it because you risk Losing the assets, which could cost like a million in some cases. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, compared to the cost of the asset, it's small, but it's still. I, I still feel like it's it's a it's a big price. So, for example, the price point that we're targeting for imagine for something like a thirty kilogram spacecraft, right? So, thirty kilogram spacecraft, something like a maybe sixteen U, something like that. So, like a big CubeSat or small microsats. Um, Athena would cost around, uh, you know, uh, around a hundred K. And uh, the recurring cost of orbital would be uh, between twenty and thirty k, depending on on the on the maneuvers that you'll be carrying out, right? So, so we think that those costs are extremely competitive for the for the industry, um, and we think that the this split model of like, all right, here's the propulsion system. If you want to operate it on your own, that's a low pro low cost propulsion system with really really good performances that can actually outcompete pretty much anyone else in the industry. Um, we we're happy with those price points because we have a huge we have a big margin on on those propulsion systems as a as a company. So so we can we're comfortable with let's say those price price points and it's still better than uh, than basically everything else that's out there in the industry. And then hey, if we can add value to you as a customer, um, and, and it's a win win scenario at the end of the day. Like we make money. Right, and and they have the ease of mind of having a um, an optimized opera propulsive operations throughout the whole lifetime of the spacecraft. So, so we think that that's the best way to approach the market at the moment. We still have to um, we still have to validate, let's say, the the price point of uh, of orbital. But from let's say from what we uh, let's say we're now let's say discussing with potential clients and so on, we think that the price point for Athena is more than more than fair for the industry. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, and again, you mentioned that rather than for them getting again the service now from those uh, orbital again, uh, you know, orbital situation awareness companies, yeah. right? So for avoiding collision, uh, yeah. you will be as a company offering them the service of again avoiding the collision uh, using your own propulsion, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it, so it, we, it, but you will yeah. still require the data of the situational awareness, right? Yeah. So exactly. is ENI going to be working in partnership with those companies? Or yeah, exactly. is that something yeah. the company has to handle themselves still? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we actually just uh, formalized a partnership with Neurospace, which is a Portuguese yeah. company uh, led by Chiara Manfletti, which is uh, some people will know her because she was also head of the Portuguese uh, space agency for, for a while. And uh, she's, you know, I think one of the brightest and best uh, of, the, of the European uh, space industry. Uh, very, very smart uh, woman and uh, very capable. And 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 she's built, a, I think, a very interesting company and a very interesting approach to space situational awareness. So so they're solving that first half of the of the problem, right? They're solving the collision avoidance warnings, right? So they, they're the ones providing the warnings. Um, at the end of the day, uh, for, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, have partnership with these companies that Again, it's a it's a complete different know how. It's a complete different business business uh, model. So we're not trying to get into the into the SAR or uh, sorry space situation awareness. Um, uh, sorry SSA. Um, uh, we're not trying to get into that business uh, model because that's not what we do. But we are going to be partnering with companies such as such as Neurospace and hopefully others um, to basically have an influx of data an influx of let's say these collision avoidance warnings that's on the client to also let's say you know deal with them in terms of let's say you know paying and and, and the subscription models but once let's say let's say that uh uh that collision avoidance has been issued uh to one of the clients in um uh that that we also have 
we can take that data and then we can generate that uh, collision avoidance maneuver, right? So at the end of the day, you need to first generate the warning and then generate the maneuver. And yeah, Orbital will be uh, completely capable of um, of generating those maneuvers uh, potentially even in in an automatized way, which is which is what we believe should be uh, should 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 become the norm really for particularly for electro propulsion because you know as you know electro propulsion is low thrust so. Um, in order to get out of the way and to reduce the really the uncertainty or sorry to reduce the uncertainty of the collision and to like avoid that collision you every second counts right every second counts so the earlier that you can you know carry out those maneuvers the better um so if we can you know potentially in the future even automatize those that part of the of the of the segment let's say or, or that part of the maneuvers then then potentially i think it's 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 uh yeah it's in everyone's uh interest i would say so it's it's right. i think it still needs to be adopted let's say that still needs to be adopted by the industry um, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, basically satellite operators accepting that, that this might be the norm in the future, but that's what we're planning to do. Right, right. All right. And, and, and what, what is the timeline, Daniel, also for, let's say, some of the satellite, let's say, companies that are now designing their satellites, right? So what is the timeline once they approach you uh, for the propulsion to be ready to be again mounted on their satellite? So uh, what is, again, the timeline for that? Uh, yeah. and, and, I, and I really liked also what you mentioned regarding the building blocks, because that's the only literally only way if you want to do it fast and you want to do it, like you know, in a uh, in a systematic way. Right. So that's the only way. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So thanks for the question. Um, so, uh, OK, timeline wise. So we we just kicked off a couple of projects from European Space Agency. One of them is uh, within the uh, I think it's uh, general support technology programs, the GSTP, um, uh, which is which is a program from European Space Agency uh, where they uh, provide, um, uh, you know, financing and also engineering support in order to be able to bring a, a product to uh, to the commercial space. So we just kicked that off for uh, for Athena. We are. Uh, actually a little bit further along than 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 you know what we probably should have been at the start of the project so we're going to be uh, i would say advancing fairly quickly with with um uh, with that project uh the timeline here is to basically be able to uh, deliver commercial propulsion systems starting next year um uh you know i mean these things you know we we we've, we've uh, they've been we've been asked in the past in the past like oh i thought you were going to deliver in 2023 and then like you know these things happen i think slip ups of like one year are are common in the industry of course if we would have you know um uh been able to close that financing around this year we probably would have gone uh much faster uh but that's that's not something that that uh, unfortunately has has happened up until up until now but the idea that the the key aspect here is to um take that gstp program take it all the way till till the end which would be get, getting us to trl8 use the um, missions that we've already booked, by the way. So we have a couple of booked missions for IODs next year in order to come out with at least uh, two missions uh, that have been verified for the propulsion system to to work in space. So that would take us to TRL nine and add, and add an extra layer of confidence because it wouldn't be just the one mission; it would be um, uh, more than more than uh, more than one mission, right? Um, and then and then start commercializing basically. So so there's a lot of moving pieces here. We need to scale the commercial the the production process while we uh, we're, we're while we're finishing, let's say, the engineering process and we're doing the IODs and all that kind of stuff. But ideally. Uh, someone somewhere towards half of next year, we should we should be able to start um, uh, selling the propulsion systems. And we've actually already been baselined uh, for a constellation that's going to be ma uh, uh, manufactured in Spain, which is the Atlantic constellation. It's actually a joint constellation between uh, Spain and Portugal. So we've actually been baselined, or we we are one of the ba uh, propulsion baselines for that constellation for a couple of the consortiums that are going to be um, uh, applying for uh, for let's say to be able to to uh, to develop that constellation. So so yeah, so we're very you know so we're very excited about let's say the next few months. Uh, again, uh, timeline is finishing the engineering, uh, building in parallel the the production capabilities and being able to deliver those first propulsion systems by uh, mid next year. That's that's on the hardware side of things. Um, on the software side of things, we are actually, as I mentioned before, we are already on a beta of or 360 uh, space mobility analysis software. So we are uh, now uh, carrying out a closed beta with uh, a number of companies in the industry, uh, a number of, uh, let's say, 
partners that we've been able to build up over the last few years. And uh, the idea here is that we're going to be, let's say, finishing that um, uh, that that closed beta probably in uh, sometime in June, uh, and then coming out with the with a with a licensable version of the of the tool by by that time. So that's that's where we are right now in terms of the products. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. So thank you again, Daniel, and we'll be uh, eagerly supporting again your journey. Uh, and we're very much again, uh, you, you know, chanting and uh, well, chanting is not the right word, but we're very much again supporting your story. story. That's you. what I wanted to say. Uh, so for individuals that want to check out more and learn more updates regarding ENI space, whether you're watching this, some of you might be watching this like months or years after uh, this recording has been done but you can make sure we go out and check out eni.space i'm pretty sure that's not changing right daniel no Where that's not gonna that's not gonna change anytime <laughs> soon un unless unless <laughs> unless we start uh buying other companies or get bought by other companies but uh but for now i think i think we'll keep the name for a while okay perfect sounds good or you can also uh look them up on linkedin and twitter as daniel has displayed those uh on his background as well all right so thank you again everyone and we'll see you soon on the next episode